everyone, and welcome to AMC Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all of the latest news from the world of movies, plus a little bit of insight into what it all means. Joining us, as always, is AMC Movie News Editor-in-Chief, John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the AMC Movie News headquarters here in Burbank, California, and we are so glad you decided to make us part of your day. I also hear AMC Movie News Senior Editor, Amy Rose Eisenbach. Hello, guys. Shout out to our boy, John Schnapp, for his amazing premiere last night for The Death of Superman Lives. What happened? It was so awesome and exciting, and we've literally been together since this has been taking shape, and it's just been so incredible. So I'm so proud of you and all your team, and yay, Schnapp! Yay, snap! And also here, shockingly still alive, is AMC's Mark Ellis. Happy Avengers Day, everybody. <laughs> and getting on, uh, and getting around to actually the, the John Schnapp thing, you know, I still remember a couple years ago he come came into our AMC Burbank 16 office when we were still shooting in that our closet converted storage <laughs> closet that we were using as a studio for a while, and he said, hey, "I'm thinking about doing this thing on Superman Lives." And I remember thinking. I, I am not I would not be interested in this concept for a movie ever unless it's being made by John Schnepp. Hell yeah. John Schnepp telling the story of this defunct weird movie that never got made is seems like a match made in heaven. And see, we've been with him over the years mm -hmm. as he's been getting this thing together, trying to land interviews, raising the funds, editing it out, and just see the guy persevere so much and push through it with sheer will, creativity, and all that kind of stuff. It's just a magnificent thing to see. So congratulations to John Schnepp. Uh, and, and I guess it's not private because it was put up on social media yesterday. Uh, John Schnepp got engaged last yeah. night. Yeah, boy. So uh, big <laughs> things. Uh, congrats to John Schnepp. If you did not, if you're in the L.A. area and you did not get out to the premiere last night, it is playing tonight at the Egyptian Theater in Los Angeles. Um, you know, the filmmakers are all going to be there. There is a Q&A afterwards. I'm actually running the q and A at the thing tonight. So get on over there. Look for your tickets online. It's at seven thirty tonight in Hollywood. All right. Talk about the live movie adaptation of the popular video game series Assassin's Creed has been ongoing for years now and has made many fans of the series wonder if the movie itself is ever actually coming. However, in a recent interview with our friends at Coming Soon, Assassin's Creed producer and star Michael Fassbender said the following. You say it's a long time, but what I found, it's all new to me, but starting to develop scripts and work on them, they take time. It just takes time to get a good story together and we really want to do it right. It's exciting. It's going to start this year will be filming in September. When asked about the reports that he'll be playing the character Desmond Miles, Fassbender responded, you don't know that. Don't listen to what they tell you. That's the first rule. Assassin's Creed is currently scheduled to hit AMC theaters in December of 2016. Mark, have the delays in the film caused you to lose any enthusiasm for this Assassin's Creed? Absolutely not. It's made me impatient because I really want to see this movie. I really want to see what Michael Fassbender brings to this film, but it hasn't made me lose any enthusiasm. I'm very excited for this project. I think this could be the one that makes video game movies good that actually gets them some respect like what X-Men was for comic book movies or what Batman was for comic book movies so this is very interesting the coolest part about this besides the fact that Michael Fassbender was asked the question and then wasn't like I don't know what you're talking about like <laughs> he embraced that he's producing and starring in this is that he didn't give away too much you don't even know if he's playing the Desmond character in Assassin's Creed if he's going to be an assassin or a member of the Knights Templar we don't know exactly what he's going to be on screen we just know that he's very involved in this project behind the screen that's exciting to me no enthusiasm lost here um i've you know i wouldn't say i've lost enthusiasm wind out of my sails with every time we hear delays oh remember it was going to come out in the summer 2015 then oh maybe christmas 2015 now it's december 2016 okay takes a little wind out of my sails but i no less have my hopes that this is going to be, look, there are two films in the pipe that we've been saying for a while could finally break that galactic universal truth. All video game movies suck. <laughs> and there are two movies now in the pipe that could crush that. You know, I think primarily one, the one I have even more hope for is Warcraft. That's got the right director, the right right cast, the right premise. But the other is Assassin's Creed in the hands of a guy in a talent like Michael Fassbender. This could be amazing. I like that he said, look, we're shooting in September. So it sounds like they've got their ducks in a row. And I like the fact that he brought the dozen thing. Look, don't just assume that you know what's going to happen. we got to take some liberties with these games. There's a lot of depth to the uh, Assassin's Creed games and a lot of different characters. They can go in a lot of different ways. So I kind of like that. And But... He didn't definitively say he's not Desmond. I think he is going to be Desmond, but he, I just think might it's be cool right. that he's, he's still keeping the curtain in front of the wizard for the time being. 
Amy Rose. Yeah, Magneto hath spoken. Magneto he's just hath so spoken. he's so good at this. And like the first role, whenever I hear that, I go, "No, the first role is you can't talk about Fight Club." That's always where my brain goes. I live in the film world. It's very silly, but I just think he would be such a good Desmond. So I'm still holding out for hope. I love this game franchise. I agree. I mean, I I would still want to argue with Mortal Kombat because I love. I will oh, defend I that. Love yeah. it. That movie. Yes. It's awful, but I love it. It is not awful, John. It's awful, but I love it. Masterpiece. It's, uh, you know, but uh, this really has, and with someone like Michael Fassbender, who's so intelligent, and I want them to take their time. I want them to get this right because it really could change the game. I think Warcraft's going to do that. So if we have two, boom. Oh, it's going to open the floodgates. Yeah. Like we're going to see a renaissance and a resurgence of video game movies like we have never seen before. I hope so. Warcraft is almost a different beast to me, though, as far as a video game film, because that is such a world that you immerse yourself in. I oh, look more yeah. at video game films like Assassin's Creed or Uncharted coming out too. I think those are the ones for that. Warcraft almost feels like its own dimension to me. Or even Portal with the sci-fi aspect. Mm -hmm. Like, just I feel like there's so many rich video games that lend themselves really well, but they haven't been able to crack the code yet. So you're right. This could be a floodgate, and I'd rather them steal that than do 15 remakes of things we don't need. So yeah. And, you know, I'm going to say this too. I, I actually am hopeful for Agent 47. I think that could yeah. actually be an interesting kind of fun movie. It's funny, I had lunch with the producer of that mm -hmm. movie, and I'm, I'm, I hadn't seen the trailer yet. I'm like, you do know if the trailer sucks, I'm going to say it sucks. <laughs> and I saw it, I thought it looked kind of fun, actually. Yeah. So here's holding out hope for Agent 47 as well. All right, what's next? Power Rangers fans were excited to discover that Lionsgate would be bringing the team back to the big screen in 2016, but the multicolored teenage heroes won't be showing up until 2017 now. According to reports, the film has been pushed back to January 13th. 13, 2017. The project still doesn't have a director attached, but reports still claim that Project Almanac director Dean Israelite is in talks. Amy Rose, does this push back to 2017 raise any red flags for you about the Power Rangers? Not necessarily, but I hope the reason is because of the successful short film, and I hope it's because they want to retool it and make it like that, because that's what I want. I don't want the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. I want these badass, gritty, dark rangers. And like, granted, I still grew up with the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, so I'm not bashing them. That's my youth, and I loved it, but that's not where we're at right now. And I f hope they saw the success of that, and maybe even kind of casted it accordingly. I mean, I think that would be really cool, but I don't think it's red flags. We live in an age of superheroes. This is a property they really want to knock out of the park. And, you know, Project Almanac, I was just kind of like, eh, I'll see it. But it definitely had Project X meets Chronicle. And um, what's there's uh, Butterfly Effect. There's a couple yeah, films that it felt like. But I actually them. thought it was pretty enjoyable. And I think, you know, to take that found footage, which can be really dry and boring and stale, or you can make it kind of compelling. And I thought it was great. So I actually think he's a pretty good fit for this. I just hope the reason is because they want to make it badass like that short film, because that took us all by surprise. I, um, yeah, <laughs> I have I have red flags going off all over the place on this, and it's not because of the push from 2016 to 2017. Although when you do a push like that, so close to when you just announced when it was going to be, and then it's like, oh wait a minute, and then like that quick, here's where my flags go off. It is no secret I have always thought that doing another live action Power Rangers movie was a bad idea, and then they announced it, and I thought it was a bad idea. And then some people on our team and a lot of you guys online started writing in some proposals about, hey, what if they did this with them? And what if they did this and took this different type of angle? And slowly but surely I started going, okay, yeah, you change the, the context here a bit and you make that type of a movie with Power Rangers? I don't know that it will work, but that could work. Mm -hmm. I thought that short film was atrocious. What? I thought it was awful. <laughs> I thought it was awful. I know it was like so, Mortal Kombat. Either, I was so. so glad. I love Mortal Kombat. <laughs> Get I over here. I was so glad. I was so glad when I realized, after watching about 30 seconds of that trash, I was so glad to find out, okay, that's not actually the movie. All right, isn't it? But here's where my red flags go off. My red flags on this story goes off, not because of the shift from 2016 to 2017, but because this studio has now gone, let's make this a summer release movie, July 2016. Let's put this in January. That for me is... Yeah. I see that. The flag, like going off like crazy. Doesn't mean it won't be awesome. This could be the greatest thing since Star Wars. It might be. We <laughs> whoa, cannot, whoa, whoa. I know, that's a little <laughs> The movie might be awesome. 
But if we're just going to ask, does it raise flags? I'm going to be honest. For me, it raises a big flag. Anyway, Mark, what about you? The January 13th thing raises a huge flag to me. And besides that, I was really excited because like Amy Rose said, I, I thought that this was all because of the short film that came out and they're actually listening to the fans. I don't like when a studio takes every comment too seriously, but when the fans all unite and they storm the gates, like what happened after that short film, they had to take note and be like, okay, let's push back. That We definitely need to retool this a little bit. So that's good news. And I like Project Almanac. That was one of the films that surprised me, which, by the way, also came out in January. So I think that if this guy can take this property, make it more like it was in the short film, then I think that that's a positive. Personally, I could care less about a Power Rangers movie. I just didn't, I, even when I was a kid, I didn't care about the Power Rangers. I was always a Ninja Turtle guy. I thought it was a, I, I just didn't care about Do you them. start all your dates with that line? I open most <laughs> dates with, do you want to get the free breadsticks at the Olive Garden? Can't they coexist, the properties? Come on. Dude, I'm more of a they Ninja can, Turtles but guy. it just doesn't matter to me. I open up every first date with <laughs> Mortal Kombat! <laughs> did it, did it. And if she does, did it, did it, did it, then yeah. you know you found right. the one. And you got to yeah. keep her. You know I've already sung that today, right? <laughs> I, I, I've done at least twice. Here's the other thing, too. Uh, one, of, one of the other things that I think people who are looking forward to, to this movie have to be hopeful is the fact that Dean Israelite, while he is not a household name, he took a movie that by all rights should have been a bad film. Totally. That mm -hmm. should have been a bad film. And he made a rather entertaining movie out of it, which is no easy feat. So if you're somebody who's like hoping Power Rangers could be good, if they finally get the ink signed on this thing, Dean Israelite's attachment is something you should be hopeful for and should give you some hope. All right, folks, we've reached that part of the show for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, she's got a few other items in the world moving news. She's going to run them down. Then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So Ashley, what do we got? The first trailer for the upcoming Tom Hardy film Legend has hit the web. Based on a true story, Hardy plays the Cray Twins, a pair of gangsters who controlled much of London's organized crime in the 1960s. John Byers saw the trailer for Legend. Are you effing kidding me? <laughs> this looks awesome. Tom Hardy playing twins will be the best twins performance since Jean-Claude Van Damme. Yes! <laughs> this is going yes. to be awesome. The trailer, just the feel of the trailer feels so great. It's got all the great grittiness of the mobster movies. You've got a, perf a world-class performer, Tom Hardy, playing two separate characters, and just their, their, their charisma is just oozing off the screen when you watch this trailer. The shocking thing to me is that there is still no North American release date for this movie yet. I hope that changes soon. But for me, this is full of buy. Mark? Oh, yeah. The, the best, like you said, since Chad and Alex were on screen. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yes, I know their name. That's the second date material. Um, when, no, when that's I, the end of the no, second date. From the end of the relationship. <laughs> Sorry, Helga. I love you. When I saw this trailer, I was like, it, my first thought was this is going to be the film that gets Tom Hardy nominated and even winning an award. But then I started thinking about it. I'm like, wait, 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 wait. How do you nominate a guy who does two roles in a movie? Do you say Tom Hardy for Led? Legend, or do you say Tom Hardy for the one guy in Legend or the other guy in Legend? But all the award stuff aside, the movie looks fantastic. I mean, this is, I, I love watching Tom Hardy in a car by himself in Lock. Yeah. So you put him, you get double the Tom Hardy. That's right, ladies. Double the Tom <laughs> Hardy in a film that seems this interesting. This is a huge, I'm very excited. Are we buying yet? Is this yeah. by yourself? <laughs> yeah. By yourself. You know, this funny thing you bring that up because I remember some of the same discussions went around about Army Hammer mm. uh, up with uh, the social network was like, well, which role do you nominate him for? I remember there was actually some yeah. talks about that. Interesting point. Amy Rose? Bye. I mean, this looks so great. Tom Hardy can do no wrong right now. He's picking such compelling roles. And I just saw Mad Max and I'm sworn to secrecy, but phew, that's all I'll say. But um, this looks <laughs> That's a so secret, <laughs> yeah. though. Very secret. You don't know what that means. You don't know what that means. Look at Maybe that I emoji. That's, that's a good news do emoji. Do you like my emoji? You like taught me well. Um, but this just looks, he has so much like suave and he's just like, he's exactly what this role should be. It's really difficult for that because when um, they cast Army Hammer, you brought that up. I was like, there are a lot of twins out in the world. Why don't you just get actual twins to act opposed to creating, you know, this whole crazy alternate reality where you have to superimpose and blah, blah, blah on that person's face and like, why? But in this case, hell yes. Double the Tom Hardy, <laughs> double the fun. And this looks so fun. <laughs> Never mind. I don't know why this just came to me, but I, I, I'll oh, no. get the numbers a little bit wrong here. But my, I think my favorite line of the social network was Army Hammer. And they're talking about somebody messing with him. He goes, no one's going to mess with me. I'm 6'3", 220 pounds, and, and there's, there's two, two of me. me. Yeah. I love yeah. that line. Yeah. That's so good. <laughs> All right, what's next? 
A few weeks ago, it was revealed that star of TV's Arrow, Stephen Amell, has joined the upcoming sequel, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, as Casey Jones. Now Michael Bay has released our first official look at Amell as Jones, wearing his trademark goalie mask with hockey stick. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2 is set to AMC theaters on June 3rd, 2016. Mark Byers saw the image of Stephen Amell as Casey Jones. Oh, this is such a huge <laughs> buy for me. Casey <laughs> Jones is just such an iconic character in Ninja Turtles lore, which you'll hear about on the third date. Stephen Amell <laughs> <laughs> playing Casey Jones. This is it's such great casting. When you see that picture, that's the Casey Jones that you would hope you would get from this franchise. I'm always a little nervous about I like this first Ninja Turtles movie that came out. I didn't love it, but I liked it. And so having Casey Jones coming back, having the shredder gonna be back in this film, I'm starting to get really excited for Ninja Turtles 2. I buy for a couple of reasons. One, you've heard me and Schnepp talk about how we both thought that movie was going to be awful. And we both really liked mm -hmm. Teenage Mutant Ninja. We had a really fun. I'm not going to say it's a great movie, but I had it's a lot not. of fun with it. <laughs> I had a lot of fun with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And here's the thing. As soon as they announced that Stephen Amell was in this, and Stephen Amell to me is a guy who is born to be a big screen action star. He just is. I mean, I may not watch his TV show anymore because I didn't like what the writers did with it, but he is an incredible talent. I'm going to tell you a little bit of an inside story too. You want to have a high quality? This is a guy that's almost impossible not to cheer for, besides the fact that he's a good Canadian kid. And obviously, <laughs> so go. who else knows how to wield the hockey stick better than a good Canadian kid? That's an kid? excellent point. And that's a good point right there. But, and the picture looks great, by the way. But I, this is going back about a year and a half now i it was ann's birthday ann my wife ann is a massive stephen amell fan huge so out on a limb i sent him a message saying it's ann's birthday uh could you drop her note or something like that he was on set of air this is the type of guy he is he was on set of arrow he left set went to his trailer still had his eye makeup on and everything the black face uh, uh, makeup stuff that he has under the mask and he makes a youtube video for ann wishing her happy birthday on the video and sent that off. You should have seen Anne's face. It was like the Northern Lights. Her face was just Aww. like glowing. She was, and that's the type of guy this is. He's really as sweet off camera as you think he would be. And it's impossible not to cheer for a success. And he's great. He's got the build for an action star. Casey Jones and this type. This is, I love this. It's a, all types of buy for me. I first of all I love that he's a class act yes, and he's he is. also absolutely gorgeous which doesn't hurt um, but I do really like this photo and I like the addition of Tyler Perry and like you know for someone like me that I also grew up in the turtles but I also grew up on the Rangers they can coexist Mark yeah. but I I just like I thought it was fine but my expectations were pretty low anyway I wasn't like this is gonna be great but considering who was behind it I, I thought you're right it was a little better than I expected um, but this is exactly what we want from Casey Tyler awesome like I feel like they're taking really good steps to get people like me that were like eh, I don't really need a sequel to be more interested and that's what you need to do my one note would be the Casey Jones that I knew as a kid Elias Cotius in the movie and then from the comic books and from the TV show, had long hair. So he, yes. he, he had long hair. And look, I'm not going to be the guy. I remember when Metallica cut their hair and everybody got really <laughs> upset. I'm not going to be that dude. You're he's, so that guy. He's, he's a diff I was a little that dude. He's <laughs> he's a different Casey Jones. I can accept that because, like you said, Stephen Amell, I think, is a star. And by the way, my birthday is July 7th, Stephen. <laughs> <just in case. laughs> What's next? It's just been announced that Academy Award winner J.K. Simmons and Emile Hirsch will be starring in the upcoming comedy The Runaround. When a globetrotting workaholic father, Simmons, tries to visit his daughter on a last-minute layover in Los Angeles, discovers that she's disappeared, he forces her awkward, nervous ex-boyfriend, Hirsch, still nursing a broken heart to help him find her over the course of one incredibly crazy night. Amy Rose Byers saw the sounds of the runaround. I mean, Simmons and Hirsch together, I have to buy it. The premise is like, whatever. I can't be like, if it was not these two stars behind it, but Hirsch is really good at playing that awkward, like really dry, good comedy. He can do anything. I think he's really talented. And J.K. Simmons, I mean, I'd be okay if he totally took the whiplash character in this and be the father. <laughs> I'd be totally fine with That's that. That's a totally different movie and I'm in. I'm totally I'm in with that. But awesome. I think that their pairing is very unlikely and I really like when studios and projects take risk like that. And this sounds like just kind of like, oh, whatever idea, but with them together in this premise, it could be a really good time. Uh, so J.K. Buy, Simmons and Emile Hirsch, I want to buy Come it on. so bad, but I can't, I gotta sell it. This premise sounds terrible. That doesn't mean it's not gonna be, it's just a premise. The execution may be great, movie may be wonderful. Granted, this is just a premise, but 
the premise to me sounds so 1987 formulaic, which maybe <laughs> an argument made that might be a good thing. It's a good year. But I, I want to buy it so bad, but I just can't. It, it sounds too cheesy to me. I'm going to sell it. I'm going to buy it because of the stars in it. I think that if, if you show me this premise and you're like, okay, it's got Liam Neeson and some kid, and I'm like, oh, okay. Sofia Vergara. I know what this, I know what this movie, <laughs> I'd buy it for Sofia Vergara. I, I'm Thunder watching that, but when you see that, I don't even know what kind of film this is going to be. Like, I, you know, so if, that's comedy, but it's, sounds it almost thrillerish yeah it? it sounds like a revenge pick or but is there going to be some lighthearted comedy in it with jk simmons you know he can do that with emile hirsch you know he's a chameleon on screen as well mm -hmm. so i'm going to buy it because the premise intrigued me once i found out who this who the talent was that's a big buy for me and after his academy award win like yeah. he can do anything right now so i feel like there's got to be something special about this project i actually interpreted this more as a comedy like quirky than like a revenge story i think that she's going to be she's not going to turn up dead or anything no they she's call it be a comedy Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So I think it's going to be quirky. And look at that smile. I love that. Speaking smile. of anything, you know, one of the films he's got coming up pretty soon, well, pretty soon in the long term, but is uh, he's in the new King Kong film, Skull Island. Mm -hmm. Him, Tom Hiddleston, and so who's the third? There's a third big name in there. I can't remember off the top of my head. But uh, Tom, Tom Hiddleston, J.K. Simmons, and a big a big A. <laughs> Giant A. <laughs> Drawing a drug name. Name. All right, folks, listen, we've reached that part of the show for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question that you'd like us to address on the show, you can email us anytime at amcmovietalk at gmail.com. Send in your questions and see if you can get on air. So for now, Ashley, what's in the mailbag? Shubham Gupta writes, John said there could be a conflict between Whedon and Marvel because of recent comments from Whedon. Do you think it is because of the runtime of Age of Ultron and Whedon wasn't allowed to make what he wanted to make as he has said that his original final cut was more than three hours long and this film is only as long as the first one. Do you think Disney or Marvel interfered because I do think that some some things were rushed in the movie. Um, well, I, let's remember, there is nothing definitive that says there's conflict between Whedon and, and Marvel. We were just, you know, we were speculating because of some of the comments, some very questionable comments. I, I'm a, you know, sorry, George, you know, Joss Whedon is my master now sort of t-shirt wearing type <laughs> of guy. I, I love Joss Whedon. I think he's great. But he's been making some very questionable uh, comments lately that that I think reasonably you can look at and say, I wonder if there's a lot of tension between him and there. But that's not to say that there absolutely is. No. There would not be any tension because he's not allowed to make a movie over three hours long. All directors turn in a cut and usually, I mean, just ask John Schnapp. I think John Schnapp's first cut of his movie was like four and a half hours long. Yeah. And I mean, that, that's the way, way it is. And you then you got to reel it in. You got to bring in a little pressure. Plus, there's no such thing as interfering with something that is yours. Avengers is not Joss Whedon's. Avengers is Marvel's. You know, a, a lot of people forget that. Everybody thinks that just Joss, they handed the whole thing to Joss Whedon, he just ran with it. Remember, Joss Whedon's first script for the first Avengers included Wasp. It, include, it included no Black Widow. And then Kevin Feige came in and said, okay, but for our bigger picture, we don't want Wasp in now. We do want Black Widow, blah, blah, blah. And Whedon's always said that's the way it should work with collaboration with the studio. So I don't think it has to do with interference. I don't think it has to do with not being able to put out a three-plus-hour movie, which I don't think many people wanted anyway. So I, I think if there – if – if there is problems, it's probably has to do with a number of other issues, but I don't yeah. think those would be it. What do you, how do you see it? Yeah, no, runtime wouldn't, I mean, you know that as a director going into this. I mean, yeah, you can say, no, I want that extra scene or this or that, but it's not just your show. There's so many, especially when you're stepping into the MCU where it's so calculated and this is not his first rodeo with the team, with Feige and everyone. And that's why they wanted him to come back because he did such a great job. Also from my conversations with Joss and just everything, why he's been so successful, he's not the the largest egotistical man where you can't give him feedback. He really seems like he would take it. So I don't think we're ever going to really know what's happening unless they want us to. And like, why speculate? If you liked Avengers, which I did, then that's all I really care about. And I really respect him as a filmmaker and also Feige above everything because of his vision. So I don't really get into the drama too much, but it, definitely it's not about the runtime. Five years from now, John Schnepp presents the death of the Joss Whedon Marvel <laughs> relationship. What happened? Okay, anyway, Mark. It, actually, I'm a little excited to see when this thing comes out on Blu-ray if we get like a Joss Whedon cut, like the Donner cut of Superman yeah, 2. Yeah, that'd be cool. If we Ooh. get to see more Avengers Age of Ultron, because 
I think the movie's awesome. And there are parts where you're like, oh, I want to know more about that story and about that story. But you got to remember, not only are we returning the six characters from the original Avengers, which was a full two-hour film, mm -hmm. you're adding two more characters. You have a villain that's more of a presence. You have another storyline that's getting deeper and darker. So you're not going to be able to make a three-hour movie. Joss Whedon, I think, knew that going in. And I don't have a big problem with a director fighting for his art a little bit and saying, like, oh, man, I wish I could have had that or I wish I could have had that. The other thing is Joss Whedon is exhausted. He was hopped up on painkillers because he broke his leg yep. at some point during the filming. I've been on painkillers before. You don't always say things you mean. Sometimes things <laughs> warble out of your mouth. And I think that he's just sick of getting the same questions. I think it's maybe the right time for him to be jumping off the Marvel ship and letting the Russo brothers take over for Infinity War and for Civil War. But I think that, that everybody's taking Joss Whedon's comments a little bit out of context per and usual. are overblowing them a little bit. Yeah. I, like it's it, That explains a lot because we've been sitting around here in the AMC Movie News office and I'll hear these like outrageously offensive and inappropriate comments being yelled out. And I'll like I'll yell, Ellis! And you'll just hear this voice yelling out, painkillers, all right, no problem, we're good. All right, we're gonna rush through the next few ones because Ray just got back with my chicken sandwiches. So what's next? And and your milk. Joshua Latona and writes. And my drugs. Hey, John and the AMC crew, Joshua Latona writing in, was just wondering, and I can assume it was totally out of your control, but thought if I can at least get an answer. Whose idea and why was it to have Prime Theaters close and renovated while Age of Ultron releases, i.e. AMC Burbank? It was my hopes to see it in that format. Okay, well, first of all, let's get something straight. There is nothing that is out of my control. Let's just get going. <laughs> no, um, yeah, here's, here's the thing, yes. The, um, I'm going to tell you up front, people at AMC are not going to like me saying this. Oh, It was not a very bright decision to shut down <laughs> the best movie theater in Los Angeles on opening day of the Avengers Age of Ultron. Not the best move. But I, I'm sure there are some, I'm absolutely positive they know that. I'm sure there were some logistical things going on behind the scenes that just made it, this is how it had to happen. And it's really unfortunate because the AMC Prime is the best movie going experience you can so have. Good. That and the AMC Dine In. Dine In uh, above all. Yeah, of the Dine In maybe above all. <laughs> and the Prime is just so sick, good. But, you know, a, a lot of people in the LA area wanted to go to that AMC Prime Theater and, and watch the Avengers in that format, the Dolby Atmos sound system, which is the best in the world. I mean, all that kind of stuff, the reclining leather, motorized leather seats, and it's, it's just the best movie going experience there is. Why was it was it shut down? Why it, it, maybe in some of your neighborhoods you're noticing some of your primes are being closed down right now? The reason being is that AMC has just entered into a new exclusive deal with Dolby, and we are relaunching the Prime, and they are going to be it's going to start with three or four theaters. Well, I think ultimately it's going to be a whole ton of them, but it's going to start with three or four. And AMC Burbank 16 is going to be one of the first ones that rolls out. And the new cinema is going to be called uh, Dolby Cinema at AMC Prime. This will be, by far, the best movie-going experience and viewing you will ever have. <laughs> this new Dolby project, it's all based around this new Dolby projection system. Remember, Prime already has the AMC Dolby Atmos sound. Now they're going to have this new Dolby projection system, which is a dual laser projection system that give you the deepest, most natural blacks you have ever seen. The richest colors. You a lot of other new projection systems just try to make things brighter, boost the power in the lamps and stuff like that. This is a totally new type of system. They just showcased it at CinemaCon in Las Vegas, and the I was not there. But I also I know somebody who was in uh, a demo of it a few months ago, and then talking to people who were at that demo at CinemaCon, this changes the game. This new system, so it sucks, and it was rather not smart to not have that Prime Theater open when Avengers opens. But I tell you, when Tomorrowland comes out, <laughs> and you're able to go see Tomorrowland in a Dolby Cinema at AMC Prime with this new dual laser projection system that Dolby Atmos sound. Look, I, I'm not big on gimmicks. I, I don't like 3D. I think 3D is a gimmick. I, it, to me, it doesn't add to the movie-going experience. Better sound, better picture, better comfort. This adds to the movie-going experience. Dolby Cinema, I work for AMC folks. Take what I'm saying with a big grain of salt. But I'm telling you all honestly, this is going to be the best, 
best movie going experience you've ever had. I cannot wait to go see Tomorrowland in this thing. It's going to be sick. But you guys noticed that the Prime was shut down, right? Well, like, yeah, like, I mean, that was the, you heard that, ladies. So the fifth date with Mark Ellis is going to be the <laughs> Dolby Cinema at AMC Prime. We're going to go see the new Mighty Morphin Power Rangers movie, 2017. <laughs> All right, folks. Well, listen, not only do we like taking your questions via email, we love taking your questions via Twitter. So if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to get via Twitter, just tweet it out and make sure you include the hashtag AMC Movie Talk, and maybe you'll see your Twitter handle on our show. So what's in the Twitter sphere? Kyle Marquise writes, Chris Pratt is in everything, it seems like. Is it more because of talent or is it his personality? Thanks. You know, that's a really great question. I adore Chris Pratt mm -hmm. because there's nothing not to adore about Chris Pratt. Um, how much range does he have as a thespian? Like, truly, like, how much can he, you know, embody a role? We Honestly, we don't know yet. We haven't seen him do enough different stuff. I liked him in Moneyball. I, I even liked him in Delivery Man. Which yeah. is not a strong film, but yeah. I thought, but I thought he played his role quite well. But for the most part, we've seen Chris Pratt being Chris Pratt, much like The Rock plays The Rock, and that's a good thing. So, how much of it is true deep talent? How much of it is his pure likability and charisma? I don't think we know yet. I think a lot of what's carrying him and propelling him right now is that likability and that charisma. We all just want to see him. He's just that likable. We want to see him on screen. Time will tell. Like, let's see Jurassic World. Let's see whatever he does after that. Maybe he'll be Indiana Jones, whatever. That let's so see cool. how much, how deep his talent goes. I don't think we've seen it yet. Amy Rose, when you think about Pratt, because I know you love him as much I as do. I do, what do you think about it? Um, I do think it's a combination. I mean, you bring up The Rock, which is whenever someone says charisma, it's The Rock. It's The Rock. But I think he's a better actor than The Rock. I think The Rock has something on screen that you, you just, you can't teach that. It's there or it's not. And I think Pratt has that as well. But I do think he has chops. I mean, he carried Guardians. Like, he was the star. And sure, he had an incredible ensemble around him, so it's a little different than, say, leading an Indiana Jones film or even Jurassic World. I think we'll know a lot more there. But I just think what people, what makes people want to work with him so much is just, he's He's so down to earth. He's so humble. He's so genuine and kind. I mean, I remember when he came in for the Guardians thing, which is still like one of the highlights of our career yeah. at AMC. <laughs> and it's just, I was like, it's the year of the Pratt. And you could just tell he looks us right in the eyes. And he's just, people love to work with him because he's just a really good person. And I think he's got talent. And I'm excited that people are taking more of a chance on him. Also, look at the transformation that he underwent. I mean, I think he's capable of a lot more than we've seen. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing that. But I do think that there's many reasons why he keeps getting roles and I do think he's talented. See, I think I think right now I would say The Rock is probably the better actor right now. I haven't seen I Chris know. Pratt yet do a role like The Rock did in Faster or like The Rock did in Snitch. Or Snitch, he was yeah, really good. Yeah, he's really good. So, yeah. and we haven't seen Chris Pratt play a role like that yet. But there were there were levels in Guardians too. There, there were moments there are. of turmoil and action in this, and there's a lot. I mean, that's what Marvel's so great at. Yeah. I mean, it's not just comedy. It's not just this. It's everything. And he carried that beautifully. He really so. did. He really did. Yeah, Mark? talent and personality are two things that have escaped me to this point <laughs> in my life. But I think that it's a chicken or egg thing. Sometimes it's like which one came first. When you look at somebody like DiCaprio or someone like Daniel Day Lewis, they're great actors. They yeah. have so much talent, and they're so talented that they can be personable on screen. Off screen, I have no idea if they're fun to hang out with. They don't seem like they are. No, Chris they Pratt don't. seems <laughs> awesome to hang out with. And so it's almost like his personality or The Rock seems awesome to hang out with. And then they've trained themselves to be more talented actors. So with Pratt, I think that he leads with his personality, but he's got a lot of talent in there too. And I think that he I think that we're gonna see that more and more and more as he takes these roles that are some big budget blockbusters like mm -hmm. Jurassic World coming out. But he's also gonna have other things where he showcases his dramatic chops, like what we got to see in Moneyball. All right, what's next? Bobby Hoskins writes, Will John Campia drive 2,800 oh. miles for Rogue One and subsequently all the episodes and spinoff movies? Thanks. That's a lot of driving. Yeah, th this comes, this spins out of a, a little th thing I revealed about how like when The Phantom Menace came out, I, I like drove 2,000 miles as a, as a pilgrimage, as a spiritual <laughs> pilgrimage with a couple of friends of mine to go to my favorite movie theater up in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, right beside Toronto to watch <laughs> the new Star Wars movie. That, that's just how important it was to me. Will I do it again? For The Force Awakens, Rogue One, probably not. I want to. I want to badly. But the Prime will be set by then. But, but Prime. <laughs> prime. Uh, but it's not that. It's I have responsibilities here. I cannot disappear from the AMC Movie News Studios 
when the new Star Wars movie comes out. I can't take four days to road trip to Toronto, watch a movie for an hour, and two days to drive there, watch for an hour, two days to drive back. I, I just can't take that time. I won't be able to do it. So it breaks my heart that I can't, but I'll have to settle with watching it at the Dolby Cinema at AMC Prime. Anyway, Mark, when which, the, when what was, are you going to do for Star Wars? When it was announced that the Star Wars teaser trailer was coming out the day after Thanksgiving on Black Friday, I was on the road that weekend at a comedy club in Cleveland, and I looked up, and there was a, there was a theater that was playing. One of the 30 theaters was going to be playing that trailer that morning and I was like okay I'm going to look at rental cars because it was about 50 60 miles away and I was going to land and I was going to get in the rental car and drive to go watch the movie and then come back in that time for the show luckily the trailer came out online so I just got to watch it in the Charlotte airport but I would drive a long way I have a fusion 2015 hybrid it gets great <laughs> gas mileage I will drive the the length of this country to go see the force awakens no problem do you got any big special plans for when Star Wars comes out yet it's still a ways away but I do actually um I'm going to go to our Disney rep <laughs> and I'm going to bring him a really nice bottle of wine and cook him a homemade dinner and promise him my firstborn and get in before everyone else. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a good plan, actually. All right, what, <laughs> one more. What do we got? Derek Satoon writes, is Wolverine going to be an X-Men apocalypse? Filming began and there's been no confirmation of Hugh, Hugh Jackman's involvement. You know, okay, so here's the thing. Before anybody laughs at the question, say, well, of course he's going to be in. Before you laugh at him, remember, he's right. There has been no official confirmation. And also Wolverine, Wolverine, Hugh Jackman. He's Wolverine. Uh, he's so synonymous with it now. <laughs> Hugh Jackman, in talking about um, Wolverine 3, you remember he tweeted out that picture with the clause. He's like, one last time. He wasn't talking about X-Men Age of Apocalypse. So before you laugh at the question, there's good reason for the question. Now, I do believe he will be in there. There has, there has not been an X-Men film yet without Hugh Jackman. They've all had, even in... First class, he was in Best there just for a minute. Ever. Fantastic yes. cameo. So <laughs> yeah, good. He has been in every single one. He is the most bankable character they have right now. And if he's telling the truth and Wolverine 3 is going to be his last ride as Wolverine, then if you got one coming out before that, you got to get him in. So how big of a role? What kind of a role would it be? I, I just don't know. Will it just be another cameo? I don't know. But I've got to believe he's going to be there. Amy Rose, what do you think? Yeah, I mean... He's really been playing with our emotions so much. <laughs> like after Birdman is like, I'm gonna play the character till I die. And then he shows the claws and again, I'm like, Hugh, like stop doing this to me. Are you dying? Like stop, because Hugh. <laughs> um, and like, no, he has been the most bankable. He's so incredible. And like in Days of Future Past, he's in the best shape of his life. And oh, I mean, yeah. what? He's a beast. But literally, but I just, I feel like because he is definitely hinting the fact that he's done and I'm glad we're getting another Wolverine. I think that's when we're gonna start to see the old man Logan storyland start taking shape but if they want to phase this character out to open the door for another because continuity is not a problem in this universe they anymore. just don't they, care they've done it but they've done it in a really <laughs> eloquent way that pleases even diehard x-men yeah. fans like myself so with the addition of deadpool with gambit with all these new characters that they're coloring in this might be the perfect opportunity to kind of phase him out and yeah i'm gonna obviously miss him like i really just can't stand what he's been doing to us but it's just a true testament to the legacy that he's left with this amazing character so i think that we will see him in Apocalypse, but I don't think it's going to be a large role, if I had to guess. Mark, will Hugh Jackman be in X-Men Apocalypse? You know, John, you said don't laugh at the Twitter question, but... <laughs> <laughs> That's yes, not nice. He's going to be in X-Men Apocalypse. I love that Derek included real Hugh Jackman's Twitter handle in there, just in case he wants to write it himself and confirm it. He's definitely going to be in X-Men Apocalypse. I think he'll have a big role. He's going to be one of the stars of that movie. As great as it is, a Jubilee's coming back this time. We have all these new mutants. You still need Wolverine in there one last time. Ching. One last ride. <laughs> All right, folks, that will do it for us for this installment of the Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, lots of great films like X X Men: Age of Apocalypse. Yes, like, I want to see that movie. Surprise screening today. That's why they closed the Prime. Don't tease me. <laughs> Avengers: Age of Ultron is now in AMC theaters. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater show time and, of course, your movie ticket information. If you want an audio only version of this episode, look in the description below and you'll find a link to our podcast feed. And most importantly. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Keep you up to date on all the great shows on AMC Movie News. I want to thank, first of all, the people sitting at the table with me. Right to my left, Miss Amy Rose Eisenbach. Amy Rose, where can people find you online? At Amy Rosie on Twitter and Instagram. And I'm heading to Arkansas to speak on a panel at Gina Davis's Film Festival. And I'm really excited about it. So if you're there, let us know. Alicia Malone and I will be there uh, representing AMC proudly. Thanks, guys. 
Over here, Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you? I brought props. You can find me on iTunes. <laughs> this is my uh, this is my comedy CD. You can get it on iTunes, nine ninety nine. <laughs> when you're downloading this podcast, go here and get Mark Ellis's comedy CD. Or free with the sixth date. There we go. Right, free with the sixth date. Free with the sixth date. I take it back when you dump me. And our. Lo- <laughs> my property <laughs> and our lovely host name is ashley mova ashley where can people find you you guys can find me on twitter and on instagram at ashley mova happy friday guys yes. and of course you can follow me on the various social media networks on facebook or on twitter just at john campia that'll do it for us guys thanks so much for joining us my name is john campia for amc movie news and until next time bye-bye